All right, good afternoon. Apparently it's seer Seersucker Thursday somewhere. So I didn't know that, but I'm embracing it. All right, uh, so as a reminder, there's an election going on in the General Assembly tomorrow. Uh, just want to remind you that um, the Secretary General will deliver remarks and should everything go according to plan. Uh, he will then <coughs> uh, speak to you at the stakeout outside of the General Assembly, what uh, I think we used to refer, still refer as the East Foyer. Um, that stakeout will only be in person. You'll be able to watch it live on web TV, but if you want to ask questions, you'll have to be there in person. We cannot do it hybrid from there. That should be around 1030, 1040. Uh, but obviously, we never know with the timing of these things. We will also try to share with you our embargoed remarks uh, before he delivers them, so you have them. Um, I just got a statement. Um, on the uh, summit meeting that um, wrapped up in uh, Geneva yesterday um, and on the, uh, you, the joint uh, statement on strategic stability, which was issued afterwards. The Secretary General welcomes a joint statement on strategic stability issued by the presidents of the Russian Federation and the United States uh, following yesterday's summit in Geneva especially the reaffirmation of their adherence to the principles that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Furthermore, the Secretary General welcomes the intention of the Russian Federation and the United States to engage in an integrated bilateral strategic stability dialogue, and he expresses his hope that this would lead to concrete arms control measures, including further reductions in the size of the world's nuclear arsenals. And this morning, the Secretary General spoke at the high-level meeting on middle-income countries. The event took place in the General Assembly Hall. He said that middle-income countries are a key presence in the United Nations, accounting for 70% of the global population. He noted that they are being squeezed from two sides. First, their rising labor costs makes them unable to compete with lower it costs countries. Second, they are unable to complete, compete in skill-intensive and higher value-added exports. Avoiding this trap, he said, requires redesigning development strategies and gradually shifting to higher value-added sectors with a focus on innovative, sustainable, and inclusive growth. He added that these countries also face varying levels of access to financial markets and diverse social and economic and environmental vulnerabilities, but that these are often overlooked as a result of false perception that income is the only measure of development. Mr. Guterres underscored that these vulnerabilities only worsened with the pandemic and called for increased finan financing and new debt mechanism, which could provide more options for these countries. And he also, Secretary General also spoke via pre-recorded video message to the International Donors Conference in solidarity with Venezuelan refugees and migrants, which is being hosted by Canada in collaboration with UNHCR and the International Organization for Migration. The Secretary General said in the message that after six consecutive years of economic con uh, contraction, the situation in Venezuela continues to impose great hardship on the living conditions and well-being of its people, forcing many to leave. He added that Venezuelan refugees and migrants are facing increasing discrimination and xenophobia and are finding it difficult to access institutional protection. The Secretary General stressed the need for inclusive policies that promote socioeconomic integration of migrants and refugees and reiterated the UN's continued support to government, civil society, and host communities in order to respond to the pressing needs in the region. He also underscored that Venezuelan refugees and migrants must be included in all vaccination efforts if we are to effectively mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And a note on Myanmar, and I think uh, you and I know we have all seen the reports of government forces burning down villages in the Kingma, in Kingma, in Magwe region uh, on June 15th, or two days ago. And I can tell you that the Secretary General is deeply concerned and disturbed by these reports which remind us of the systematic burning of villages in North Rakhine State, which we saw in the past, and which led to the dramatic exodus of the Rohingya people. 
The Secretary General continues to strongly condemn the continued repression by the security forces against civilians across the country, which again is having a major regional ramifications and requires a unified international response. Our colleagues in the country team in Myanmar say that the recent violence, including the burning of these villages, illustrates the sharp deterioration of human rights environment in Myanmar. In addition to the burned villages, our colleagues point to the discovery of two mass graves in Miawadi Township in Kain State, which contained the remains of 25 people who were reportedly detained on the 31st of May by the Karen National Defense Organization. We once again call on all involved in the current crisis to ensure that international human rights norms and standards are respected. This includes minimizing harm to civilians and civilian infrastructure, as well as prohibiting collective punishment against communities, families, or individuals. We also call for those responsible for human rights violations to be held accountable. And a programming note, as you know, in Myanmar, uh, there will be a private meeting by the Security Council tomorrow. Uh, during that meeting, the Secretary General Special Envoy, Christine Trogner Bergner, will uh, brief and then she will come to the Security Council stakeout in vivo uh, and brief uh, you and take a few questions at the stakeout. Uh, and as a reminder, because of the heavy news load, obviously the Secretary General's own stakeout, Ms. Schrockner Bergner, we will not have a noon briefing uh, so as not to compete with ourselves. Um, and we expect Ms. Schrockner Bergner to be the stakeout around noon or so, but we'll let you know. On Lebanon, the special coordinator for Lebanon, uh, Joanna Ronenka, today called on countries taking part in a French-hosted virtual conference in support of the Lebanese Armed Forces to do everything in their power to meet the immediate emergency needs of Lebanon's military institution, which has been deeply impacted by the economic crisis facing the country. She noted the pivotal role played by the Lebanese Army in safeguarding Lebanon's security and stability and in the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1701. She said that the meeting, uh, meeting, she said that the meeting the Army's immediate material and human needs are necessary to keep it functioning, and added the United Nations will support the armed forces in instit instituting follow-up arrangements for today's conference. An update on the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that the security and access situation in Tigray remains complex and extremely fluid, with active hostilities impeding people's access to aid and the movement of aid workers. In May last month, more than 500 cases of gender-based violence, including rape, were reported. This includes about 70 reported cases against girls under 18. Our humanitarian colleagues expect the actual number of cases to be significantly higher given the underreporting uh, due to the fear of stigmatization, retaliation, limited access to trusted services providers, and widespread impunity for perpetrators. Despite challenges, humanitarian partners are scaling up the response as quickly as possible. Under the latest response plan for northern Ethiopia, since May 1st, more than 2.3 million people out of the targeted 5.2 were reached with food aid. This includes 654,000 people who were reached last week alone. The response is, however, still not in keeping pace with the mounting needs. We continue to call for safe, unimpeded, and sustained access. More funding is also urgently needed. And a quick COVID note, COVID note, our, in Brazil, our UN team led by the resident coordinator, Silvia Rux, continues to support national and local authorities to address the multiple impacts of the pandemic. UNICEF sets up, set up safe water distribution areas and four sheltering facilities that host Venezuelan refugees and migrants in the Amazon region. For its part, UNHCR, along with authorities, have opened up a space for refugees and migrants that will provide documentation, legal advice, and psychosocial assistance. Um, UNHCR, UN Women, and the UN Global Compact have also launched an initiative to boost livelihoods and empower refugee women with a four-week training course on sales and customer service for Venezuelan women. And as part of the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor and the World Day Against Child Labor, the International Labor Organization, as well as the Brazilian Federal Labor Prosecutor's Office and its partners, launched a national campaign in Brazil to raise awareness to combat child labor, a risk that has intensified globally with school closures due to the pandemic. And today, 
is the World Day to combat desertification and drought. In his message, the Secretary General said that land can be our greatest ally, but right now it is suffering. He said that land degradation from climate change to the expansion of agriculture, cities and infrastructure is undermining the well-being of 3.2 billion people harming biodiversity and enabling the emergence, the emergence of infectious disease such as COVID-19. He added that restoring degrad degraded land is simply an, sim excuse me, is simple and inexpensive. It could generate an extra $1.4 trillion in agricultural production each year. He called on countries to make healthy land central to all their planning. And the World Health Organization says today that suicide remains one of the leading causes of death worldwide. According to its latest estimates published today, every year more people die as a result of suicide than HIV, malaria, breast cancer, or war and homicide. WHO data shows that in 2019, more than 700,000 people died by suicide. This represents one in every 100 deaths. To help countries improve suicide prevention and care, WHO also released comprehensive guidance with four main strategies. Among them are limited access to the means of suicide, educating the media on responsible reporting on suicide and supporting adolescents. You can find more information on WHO's website. And um, today we have a member state that paid its dues in full, uh, becoming the 109th to do so. And that uh, the main port of that member state lays in the Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the Demara River. Anybody know what country that is? Uh, oh, come on, I can't. Oh, you're cheating. It is Guyana, and we thank our friends in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana, for paying its budget dues in full. All right, Edie, at least you gave it a try. Um, a couple of questions, uh, Steph. Does the Secretary General have any reaction to the arrest today? in Hong Kong of five editors and executives of the pro-democracy Apple Daily uh, on charges of colluding with foreign powers. Listen, we've obviously uh, seen these latest developments, and I would say what um, we have said a number of times uh, is that an independent media is a fundamental pillar of an open and participative society. Yep. Next. Um, the uh, leader of the DPRK, Kim Jong-un, um, has said that there is uh, food insecurity there. I wondered whether um, the DPRK has asked the United Nations for stepped-up assistance. Uh, that's a very good question. I will check with our humanitarian colleagues. Uh, Thank yep. you. Okay. Madam. Oh, sorry, I had that on. Uh, thanks, Steph. Uh, given the Security Council is talking about Haiti today, uh, and given that the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has a book out now in which he calls Haiti and the cholera epidemic their uh, a stain on the United Nations. Given the United Nations history in Haiti with cholera and given the comments of Secretary General Bond calling this a stain, I'm wondering uh, if Secretary General Guterres uh, would share that assessment and if he uh, has considered perhaps a different approach to making victims whole, given that the request for some $400 million to compensate them uh, was severely underfunded and only about $8 million has gone to victims so far? Look, I, I think uh, dealing with the outbreak of cholera in Haiti has been uh, first and foremost on Secretary General Guterres's uh, mind. It's one of the first initiatives he took with this uh, the new approach, the, the kind of dual track one, just supporting uh, the um, uh, the, glo the, um, the public health system in Haiti, also supporting those communities that have been uh, that have been impacted. I think we also need to show see to note that there really hasn't been a single case of uh, of cholera in two consecutive years in Haiti, which is a big uh, accomplishment, and it's the accomplishment of the Haitians themselves. We've been supporting their public health uh, efforts. Um, 
the you know the new approach included uh, support for those Haitians most impacted. There's been a funding issue, right? Uh, we've we haven't had the funds that we uh, uh, that we need to for all all the tracks, and we continue to appeal uh, for uh, for funds for that. Can I can I just yeah. follow up too? Because I mean, he Bond called the lawsuit on behalf of the victims an attempt at extortion. Would the Secretary General share that assessment as well? And, and would it help, perhaps, if the UN more forcefully acknowledged its role there? Because that has been also a bit uh, dodgy of an explanation, if you will. Um, you know, I, I can only speak for the sitting Secretary General uh, one at a time. Uh, I, I think the, the, what this Secretary General, and, and frankly the previous one also said about Haiti, was, uh, was very emotional uh, in trying to support the people of Haiti, understanding what cholera has done uh, to Haiti. On the legal process, I, I would refer you to what we said after each, um, each decision. I mean, that's a legal process, and we've said what we've had uh, to say on that. Okay, Toby and then Celia. Thanks, Steph. I know uh, tomorrow's gonna be very busy on Myanmar, um, so we'll be focused on that there. But now we've got mass graves, we've got villages burned down. Is, this, is the fundamental strategy of the UN, as far as you know from the Special Envoy and, and other officers, is it changing? Uh, well, you know, the, the goals remain the same. Uh, the, the strategy, the, the, the main point of the strategy is really a unified voice in response uh, to the tragic, in, the tragic uh, trajectory we have seen in, uh, in Myanmar since February 1st. Uh, we understand and that they will, we expect a vote in the General Assembly on a, on a resolution tomorrow, and maybe, maybe our colleague Amy may have more on that uh, today if she's briefing. Um, we hope that we hope the international community continues to speak with a single uh, voice on this, as well as to engage uh, with the, the the authorities in 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 Myanmar, and trying to restore uh, basic freedoms. Right, the freedom to be alive, the freedom not to have your village burned down, the freedom to have journalists not in prison, uh, the freedom to have doctors not harassed. Um, all of this, but this this demands a communal effort. But as you say, it is a trajectory, and it is possible to predict the endpoints of trajectories. So, does this mean you know we could have seen this coming? So, uh, has there been a a, a failure uh, of uh, from the UN in terms of the response that we've seen so far? I think it depends what you mean by by the UN. Right. I mean, we uh, the, the the special envoy is a diplomatic envoy. I mean, uh, the, the, representing the secretary general, um, we know what levers of power that the secretary general has. Um, but others, uh, regional organizations, member states um, have a critical role to play because, frankly, as in many situations, they hold more power. Um, but we will continue um with the goal that we've stated in the beginning. Celia. Steph, the French have announced the end of Barkhane. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, they have asked for uh, 2,000 more peacekeepers to be sent to uh, Mali. And at the same time, in the streets, some Malians are asking for the Russians to come. So where are we right now? Well, I know. I know. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> you know where we are better than I know where we are. Um, in, in all seriousness, uh, the 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 people of Mali um, deserve a uh, deserve the support of the international community. Uh, they have the support of the United Nations. We are a part of what the international community can do. Uh, our mission 
continues to be, frankly, in the front lines. I mean, and that you can see from uh, the, the the tragic uh, the tragic death of our of our Chadian peacekeepers, uh, from the continued attacks on the on the outposts that we have in in the north. But the the, the Malian leaders, the political leaders of Mali, also have a respons- have a critical responsibility to their own people. Uh, and that's why we need to see a transition back on track uh, for a return uh, to democracy. That is the only way through a political, uh, a political uh, agreement between the leaders and all the parties involved that you will only get calm back uh, to Mali. As far as the, um, uh, the mandate given to us by the Security Council, we continue to follow it to a T. Will the UN agree to send 2,000 more people? Well, I mean, we, the, 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 the change in the, in, in the ceiling of, uh, of any peacekeeping mission is a decision taken by the Security Council. We, of course, once it's there, we implement it, but then it is also up to those member states to provide those troops uh, to our peacekeeping colleagues. Okay. Um, let me see if there's anything in the chat. Uh, I don't. Let's see. Oh, James. Uh, James Reinald. Hi there, Stefan. And Thanks then so Abdelhamid. much. Yep. Um, you gave us a little bit of a um, uh, info on the response to the Putin Biden meeting. Um, one thing we've learned that the gentleman did discuss is this cross-border aid operations into Syria. Sadly, they didn't reach an agreement. Is Mr. Guterres disappointed by this? And will he play an active role in trying to bridge these differences in the run-up to July 10th? Well, I think the Secretary General has been playing an active role. Uh, he has been stating his, his uh, position publicly and privately uh, to members of the Security Council. Uh, especially the per- five permanent members, about the critical need to have that one remaining crossing open, the Babel uh, Hawab crossing. Babel Hawab. Yeah, thank you, crossing uh, remaining open. I mean, it's no secret uh, that we have been saying over and over again during this briefing and others of the, the critical use of that briefing to bringing aid to millions of Syrians uh, in, in the area. Um, ultimately, uh, the decision is one that will be taken in the Security Council chamber. It has to be done before July 10th, and we hope for a positive outcome. Uh, and thanks. And also on um, uh, Myanmar, Toby just asked you a bunch of questions about all these meetings tomorrow. Um, one issue that keeps on coming up and will be coming up tomorrow is whether or not to impose an arms embargo or some kind of weapon transfer restrictions to Myanmar. I can't remember if you guys have actually got a formal position on this, but what does the SG think? Arms embargo against the junta or not? Well, what we've always said is that sanctions imposed by the Security Council need to be targeted, and they need to be targeted to those who hold the power, and they need to be targeted in order for them not to inflict more pain on those who don't hold the power. And that continues to be our position. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Abdel Hamid. Okay. Uh, then, if he's not uh, asking a question, I think we will leave it at that. Uh, Amy is not briefing, and um, that's it. We shall. See, we won't see you tomorrow here, but we uh, two briefings tomorrow. We'll keep you updated on the times uh, of both of those. Thank you.